Okay, so melanogenesis um, is the process of making melanin. Uh, and so we're going to talk about the process, which is shown here in the figure. So the, the hormone that's involved in causing melanogenesis is MSH. So MSH is going to bind to its own receptor, which is the MSH receptor. Now, the MSH receptor has actually got several different subtypes. And in the textbook on page 166, table 8.1, it details a lot of those different uh, receptor subtypes. The receptor su subtype for melanogenesis is going to be the MC1 subtype. And so we're going to hone in on MC1 since we're talking about melanogenesis. So melanogenesis is going to occur in skin melanocytes. MC1. Okay, so this is all happening in the skin melanocytes. And that's the biochemical pathway, the cyclic AMP second messenger system uh, that you have here. All right? So you basically already should know the ins and outs of a generalized cyclic AMP system. So once the receptor is bound, the MC1, it's actually a G linked protein receptor. So we're going to activate a G protein that then activates. Adenylate cyclase, we have cyclization of ATP into cyclic AMP. And then we lead towards the cell response. So that's what's happening down here in this figure, is what's happening after protein kinase A is activated in the presence of cyclic AMP. So the cell response is to have a genetic production of an enzyme called tyrosinase. Tyrosinase. So what tyrosinase does is it's actually going to act in, uh, in, in its production on converting tyrosine to dopa and then dopa to a molecule called dopa quina. So using tyrosine as a starting product, tyrosinase enzymatically converts that tyrosine to dopa quinone, and it goes through dopa, which is a precursor also to dopamine. So we begin to upregulate the production of this molecule dopaquinone. And then what you can see in this figure is you have further mechanical, biochemical uh, uh, processing of that dopaquinone, several different intermediates, and then you get the production of melanin. Further biochemical synthesis. And we begin to pack melanin inside of this structure called the melanosome. So the melanosome is a vesicle that contains melanin, which is a pigment molecule. Now, <clears throat> melanin is used to change colors in, <clears throat> in the skin. And in a lot of <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of cases, it's actually going to be put over the nucleus. 
to protect that nucleus from incoming UV radiation from the sun. And so the melanocyte produces melanin, and then melanin has to be delivered to other cell types, especially within the epidermis. And so we have a melanosome, basically a, a vesicle packed with melanin, and it gets released. Happen, it probably is happening through an exocytotic mechanism, but the driver of that exocytotic mechanism, how it, it's, it's initiated, is actually kind of part of it. So the mechanism of secretion is fuzzy, but it's probably acting through what is labeled as a cytocrine mechanism, which is a basically cell-to-cell -cell type signaling system. So really what I want you to know is that we pack the melanin after it is biochemically synthesized, stemming from activation of a cyclic AMP system um, that's activated by MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone, leading to the production of melanin that gets packed into the melanosome, and then that melanosome is moved up to the membrane to release the melanin into the surrounding tissue. So the next question is what triggers the hormones secretion? So we now understand what happens when MSH is present, we produce melanin, but what controls MSH secretion? And one organism in particular is um, really good at MSH secretion and uses it for some pretty interesting biological phenomena. And those uh, uh, organisms are amphibians. And so I want to kind of hone in on the amphibians and take a look at the processing of MSH in amphibians and give you an idea how all of this works, at least in these organisms. So amphibians live in the environment, and they are semi-terrestrial, semi-aquatic organisms. So they spend some, life, some of their life on land, some of their life in the water. And when you look at the amphibian from the MSH secretion, you basically have amphibians on different types of surfaces, right? So if they're in the water, you may be on a gravel bed. If you're out of the water, you may be on something that uh, has a lot of hubris in it or, or other organic material. So the color of that surface changes. With the changing of that color surface, the light that reflects off of that surface changes as well. Okay, And you've all seen some of this happen where you have certain organisms that they can blend in with their surroundings, and they don't have to always be on the same surrounding to blend in. So in amphibians, when they go to a new surface, a new colored surface, the right light reflection actually changes from different surface to different surface. So light reflection is differential. And I'm going to refer to this as being biased on the backdrop. So if you're on a really white surface, the light that's bouncing off of there has one characteristic. If you're on a dark surface, you now have a different characteristic of the light that bounces off of that surface. Now, one of the things that happens with, um, with light reflection, the reflection is you have an angle of, um, of refraction. Okay? Now what this means for the amphibian who's sitting here on a surface is as the light bounces off, it hits different parts of the eye. It comes into the eyes of the amphibian in different directions. So we have 
the different angles that the light is going to come off of different surfaces. And so one of the experiments that's been done, uh, in particular in a salamander known as the tiger salamander, which you'll find in the American Southwest, is they've taken tiger salamanders and they've put the tiger salamander on dark colored background. You know, this is, I, I'm kind of picturing this as you have a lab where you have aquariums that have been set up and those aquariums have different backgrounds, different background colors, okay? And so you have a set of tiger amphibians that put in a dark background, some that get put in with a light background. And then you control the ceiling lights and temperature and all that kind of stuff. So when you put a tiger salamander on a dark background, you're going to have light that bounces off that, that background, off of that dark background and is going to be absorbed. Now, what ends up happening with this darker background is the amount of light that comes off of the surface, because it's a dark background, more of that light's absorbed rather than reflected. And so you have lower amounts of light that bounces off and reaches that dorsal surface of the eye or the superior surface of the eye. Okay? And I'm going to draw a picture out here in just a second to kind of highlight this. So you have low amounts of light that reach the dorsal or the top inner surface of the eye. I'm going to call that the aspect of the retina. Now, the other thing that you have going on, both in the experimental setup and then also out in the wild conditions, is you have light coming down from above, from the sun. So you have light that comes down and bounces off of the surface and reaches the dorsal surface of the eye, and then you have the light coming down from the sun, and that's going to that's going to reach the bottom part portion of the eye. Aspect. So from our light source overhead, we also are going to have high amounts of light that reaches the lower part of the eye. Okay? So you, what we're going to need to do here is we're going to need to keep track of the light as it, as, as it uh, interacts with the dorsum and the lower part of the eye. So, here's our salamander, and he's sitting on a dark surface. If I'm trying to evade predators, if I'm trying to survive in a natural wild environment, what type of color do I want to probably be in this scenario? I'm on a dark surface. I want to blend in. So what? I want to be a darker color. So when you get put on a dark surface, you have the light that bounces off, lower amounts reach the top part of the eye, you have the light coming down from the sun, large amounts come down and reach the bottom part of the eye or the retina, and this causes a dark coloration in, um, in the salamander. So this results in a dark skin adaptation. All right, so now let's take that same salamander that's been adapted to the dark and put that salamander on a light surface. And so now we have a light background. Now the light that comes in and bounces off, less of it is absorbed, and more of it is going to reach the dorsum of the eye, of the retina. So we're still going to have light that's reflected, but now, as compared to our dark background, we have much larger amounts that reach the dorsal aspect, the dorsal aspect of the eye.
what's going on with the light from above? It's actually the same. The sun's not changing because it's on a light background. You still have large amounts of light that come down and hit the lower aspect of the eye. And so now these two different surfaces, which by the way, we're going to find out are neurologically connected. These two surfaces are receiving a different pattern of light. Basically, we can now look at the light path, the light background is having high above and high below, whereas with the, the, the dark pattern, we had low above and high uh, on the lower surface. So we get these two different patterns for the two different backgrounds. And what would you expect here for a skin pattern on a light background? You would expect a lighter skin color, so you'll blend in and evade predation. So with this pattern of light exposure, we have a better uh, a light skin can better adapt. Okay. So this is the observation that we do. We know some, a little bit of something about the lights coming in and the different patterns on the top part of the eye and the bottom part of the eye, and we know the result: darker skin when you have less light re reflecting off of the surface, lighter skin when you have more light reflecting off of the surface. So now let's put this to the biology and the physiology. So to get from the different reflective conditions between our two backgrounds leading towards changes in skin color, we're going to control this by a neuroendocrine reflex. And I want to draw this out for you so that you can see this neuroendocrine reflex. Okay? So this is our surface. So we have two different surfaces. We have a really light surface and we have a really dark surface. Okay? And then we have the sun that's affixed in the sky. So when the sun comes down and interacts with the really dark surface, we have very low amounts of light that's reflected. When the sun comes down and interacts with that white surface, you have a lot of light that, that bounces off. Okay? Now over here, if this is the eye, Okay, so this is the eye of the organism. We basically are looking at two patches of retina. Okay, so you kind of have the dorsal aspect and the caudal or rostral. Actually, you probably shouldn't. Let's go with rostral. So dorsal and rostral. Okay, so basically top and bottom. Okay, and so when the light comes in from what's being reflected, we have a lot of light that reaches this aspect of the, of the eye here, the dorsal aspect, not as near as much that reaches on the, on the dark condition. Now from the sun, in both conditions, I have a lot of light that reaches the rostral or the bottom portion of the eye. Okay? So this is basically everything that we just described here. We know that this is going to result in light-colored skin. This is going to result in dark-colored skin. So extending from the eye, we have neurons that extend from both of these areas. Oops. We have neurons that extend from both of these areas.
And those neurons reach places like the post-optic region of the brain. Okay? And so that post-optic region of the, of the brain, you then have neurons that run down to uh, the pituitary. And in this case, because it's amphibians, it's actually going to be the pars intermedia. And in the pars intermedia, so this is our section of tissue. Intermedia. I'm going to have cells that are called melanotropes. Okay, so that's my melanotropes. So pars intermedia, this is the pituitary. In there I have the uh, melanotropes. And so I'm going to have individual cells that are innervated from the post-optic area. And then I'll have some neurons here as well come down and innervate these cells. All right, so I have this neural circuit. When light reaches the retina, it, it's going to activate or deactivate these neurons. And so we're going to change the signaling pattern coming all the way down through to the melanotropes. So up here on the top, this is going to have a positive influence. It's going to have a positive influence on creating action potentials that run through these neurons. Down here on the bottom, this will have a negative influence. Okay? So when light reflects off here, we get a positive influence. And this leads towards the production of dopamine. So this is for the positive, positive pathway here. We, we lead to the production of dopamine. When we have high levels of dopamine, that means that we have high levels of activity coming from this coming from this this neuron here and if we trace it all the way back we get to this light colored surface so dopamine is actually going to inhibit the melanotrophs and prevent those melanotrophs from producing msh so no msh Now these neurons here in the pre-optic area, so this is getting a little, a little bit tight. Okay, so we have pre-optic neurons here. They will actually produce acetylcholine when they are activated. That'll be the neurotransmitter that gets released. And acetylcholine, when it is produced, causes the melanocytes to begin to produce MSH. And so that will have a positive influence on the production of MSH from the melanotropes. Okay? So with the sun, we get high amounts of light that gets produced. That has a positive influence here on that dorsal aspect action potentials run out, causing post-optic neurons to release dopamine. Dopamine inhibits MSH production. So we end up with a white-colored skin. When we're on a dark surface, we reduce that activation there so that post-optic neurons begin to produce less dopamine. The reflection coming, or the, uh, the direct um, sunlight on the bottom portion of the eye causes those pre-optic neurons to begin to produce um, acetylcholine, and that acetylcholine interacts with the MSH, causing, or with the melanotrophs, rather, the cells that produce MSH, causing those to upregulate MSH. Clear as mud, right?
So I'm going to give you some more notes on this figure here. Does everybody kind of have this figure drawn out? Okay. Hopefully you drew yours a little bit better than mine. And so it's all about activating the neurons from the post and the preoptic areas to release dopamine to inhibit MSH or acetylcholine to upregulate MSH. Okay. So what we're showing here in this figure is that the retinal surface, the retinal surface is innervated. In that upper surface, it's under positive control, okay? So that upper surface will create action potentials when it receives high amounts of light as the light's reflected off of the light surface. So the upper surface is under a positive control, and we lead that, that innervation leads to the post-optic nucleus in the hypothalamus, okay? Now, when we activate the post-optic nucleus, this results in an aminergic release of dopamine. Okay, so why is it aminergic? It's aminergic because dopamine is a monoamine, right? So dopamine is a single amino acid that's been modified. This idea of aminergic is because it's an amino acid, right? So aminergic release of dopamine. Neurotransmission of dopamine when we activate the neurons of the post-optic nucleus. So this release, this neurotransmission in our amphibians, in our tiger salamanders, is going to be released in the pars intermedia. And what those uh, dopamine molecules do when they interact with the melanotrophs is they hyperpolarize the membranes of those melanotrophs. Yes, it's under a positive control. That just means we activate the post-optic nucleus. And when we activate the post-optic nucleus, those neurons release dopamine. That dopamine interacts with the melanotropes at the pars intermedia of the pituitary, and they are hyperpolarized, meaning they become more negative. So it's harder to trigger those to uh, respond to a stimuli. And the result here is for MSH to not be secreted. And because we're not secreting MSH, we have no melanogenesis that occurs, right? So we're not releasing any melanin, and so these salamanders are no longer able to produce a dark pigment that collects up in the skin, and they remain very light in color. Okay? It's pretty cool, isn't it? You guys didn't realize I knew anything about it, too, because I could tell. I just do stuff about people. The lower aspect of the retina is under a negative control. <clears throat> and these neurons innervate, or the, the retina here, the neurons innervate to the preoptic nucleus. And when these neurons leading to the preoptic nucleus are stimulated, action potentials leave uh, or, or uh, cause the release or cholinergic uh, release of acetylcholine. So 
when we start to release acetylcholine. And there's actually two different places that have, this happens. And I didn't highlight it probably as well as I should have in the, in the picture that I drew. Uh, so we're going to directly interact with the melanotrophs. But we're actually, this is where the negative control comes in, we're actually also going to interact with the aminergic neurons from the post-optic nucleus as well. And we're going to down-regulate the function or the action of those neurons. So we're going to in begin to inhibit dopamine release. So we're going to result in lifting of MSH inhibition. So as long as dopamine is present, present within the melanotrophs, we're going to have no MSH that can be secreted. We're now directly down-regulating aminergic release of dopamine. That means dopamine levels decrease around the melanotrophs. And so that inhibition gets lifted. We're no longer going to be inhibiting MSH secretion. And so MSH is secreted. Even with this part of the process, we really end up with no melanin deposition. We're releasing MSH, but we don't trigger deposition or the deposit of melanin to uh, cells within the epidermis. And so this, if this is the only thing that we were to do, even though we're on a dark colored background, we'd still only end up with white colored skin. Okay? And so there's actually a second interaction that occurs, and that second interaction is for the direct cholinergic activation of the melanotrophs themselves, the cells that produce the melanocytes. So we begin to inhibit the dopamine signal, and then directly with the melanotrophs, we override the dopamine signal. What you'll remember is that when dopamine was present, it hyperpolarized the melanotrophs. We're now going to begin to depolarize. So depolarization occurs, and this causes MSH to be released. And then we activate this mechanism over here, leading towards the secretion of the melanosome, and we end up with melanin deposition. And now we get our dark skin color. And now it begins to collect up to the epidermis of the amphibians, and as it collects up, they become darker in color. They blend into that dark background. I have this much stuff. I think we will be done. Can you just go ahead and finish? Great job. <laughs> Oh, 
All right, I'll see you all uh, after chapel and we'll finish this up. I just want you to know that right now the uh, video is still recording, so careful with what you say. I don't know how to turn it off either. Uh oh. <laughs>